yeah, to experience new parts of myself, new parts of the world and, and to have an experience with the other. And, you know, the Arctic, I think for me, you know, represented, uh, you know, the furthest I could go from the known, the furthest I could go from my comfort zone, from, from everything that I, that I knew at that point in time, it, it represented the edge of the world for me, you know. Hi guys, welcome back to another episode of Chat with Nomads. Today, super excited to have with me Jay Top, who is one of the directors of an upcoming film that's supposed to release at the end of this year called Digital North, co-working in the Arctic Circle. So I've been lucky enough to see a rough trailer concept of it, and I'm like super interested and looking forward to watching it, which is why I got Jay here today to talk to us more about his story as well, the, as well as the whole production process and his discovery in the Arctic Circle. Hey Jay, welcome to the show. Hey, so good to be here, Nan. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me. I'm uh, I'm excited to chat. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I was super intrigued when I first heard about it, and then I reached out to you, and then you were kind enough to send me a look at the concept that you guys are doing. And it's one of those things that I think I kind of get a general idea of what it is about, but it's really the storytelling of the documentary that's like super interesting that makes me still look forward to watching the whole thing. Um, the trailer was pretty inspiring, I think, particularly because of the choice of music. And I know that that trailer is not even the final concept that you guys are doing, right? Like, there's still improvements and things to be made. So before we start going to the film, let's get an introduction of yourself, right? Like, where do you come from and how do you even get into the digital nomad lifestyle? And then we can move into the juicy part of, about the film. Yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah, so to introduce myself, my name is Jay. I'm uh, 22 years old. From, originally from the Gold Coast, Australia, um, like a surf town on the, on the East Coast. Uh, and yeah, I'm, I'm coming in Sicily. I've been traveling the world um, pretty much since I was 18. I've, I've done a couple of quick little stints home, but I've been doing the digital nomad thing, yeah, since I was about 18 years of age. Um, I got into running my online business in my, in my teenage years. Um, you know, my, my parents always had their own businesses. My grandparents bought and sold small businesses. So entrepreneurship was kind of in my, in my DNA and it was bred into me from a young age. And um, due to different challenges and opportunities in my youth, I, uh, I dove into digital marketing to first help my parents' business um, and help them acquire new customers online. And that's where I learned skills like Facebook ads and, and funnel building and, and the customer acquisition. And I was lucky enough to, to learn a lot, find some great mentors and uh, be able to, you know, turn into a, a business that now, you know, has 16 members uh, across three continents and you know I get to travel the world doing what I love and yeah and, and that includes creating uh creating films like Digital North. Sounds exciting. So did you did you start your digital marketing business before? So did you start a business and then realize that you can take it on the road and do that? Or did you start by wanting to go on the road and then finding out what kind of businesses can you do in order to make that dream happen and then go into digital marketing? Uh, a bit of both. So I started like I knew from a young age that I wanted to be a business owner. Um and I had an opportunity with, uh, you know, with my brain to get into like social media marketing to start with and then Facebook ads. Um, and, you know, freedom was like the biggest driving force to, to building a business. Uh, freedom financially, freedom geographically, freedom of time, uh, freedom of relationships. I wanted to work and live and be around people that I loved. And I wanted the freedom to be able to like pursue my purpose. So they, so, so to start with, I didn't necessarily have all those freedoms, but they were like the guiding pillars of where I was going to take the business um, surrounded by those things. During COVID, I went home for just over a year and did lease an office. And we had an in-house team of, of six people like in on the Gold Coast. Uh, but as soon as those borders sort of opened up again, I uh, got rid of the lease and <laughs> took the remote and, and I was out of there. <laughs> and, and when you first started, like when you first started going onto the road, do you have a destination in mind? Like this is the first place I want to visit, and then you go there, or how did it? How how do you start off with the traveling? Yeah, so my first trip was just like two months when I was like seventeen, um, and I did uh, like California, like the west coast of California, um, some parts of of um, of Canada and, and into Mexico, just like just over the border into Mexico. Um, so I got like a little taste there, but then I so it was, it was a short trip, and then I went home and um you know just got back into the rhythm of life and started planning the next trip and i, I grew up in like a christian family and I, i'm really grateful that i had a, a religious upbringing which you know taught me a lot but uh one of my biggest desires for some reason was to go to like israel <laughs> mm -hmm. so so my second trip my proper big trip was it was supposed to just be like a month-long trip to israel um which turned into a year-long journey all through the middle east north africa and europe um 
yeah, which really changed my life forever that trip. That's that's interesting. We will dive a bit into part of the trip, I assume, when we start talking about your journey, because I do, I've been looking through Instagram a bit and some of these short videos that you film about yourself talking about the whole process and there are kind of very interesting things that I'm quite intrigued about that I definitely want to hear about. So let's let's move into this filming part, right? Like what got you to the Arctic Circle? Because obviously when we talk about the Nomad Hubs, right? The Arctic Circle was never part of it. Or, or kind of, <laughs> but that's not the immediate thought. I think I think part of it is because of the cost, right? Even in terms of traveling, when travelers look at it, the, the Nordic region tends to be, you know, the more expensive part of things. So what made you go there in the first place? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, there's definitely um, more barriers to entry for travel in, in the Arctic Circle, whether it's financially, um, or weather conditions or, or distance, um, climate, there's, there's many barriers. So it's not, a, it's not a typical digital nomad destination. I originally found myself um, there in between tours. I was touring with a friend's band um, briefly in 2019. And in between tours, I had a week off and I ended up going to Norway and I, I heard of this little surf town um, and ended up going there and you know met a girl and a Swedish girl who was living in this little surf town so I went back and forth a couple of times that year and like but it was the summer it was like you know summer spring and it was further south in Norway it wasn't in the Arctic Circle but through my connections um for my time in that town I heard about the places up further north um in Unstad and and that in the Arctic Circle so I um yeah so I was a couple of years later I found myself um back in Holland back on the road after the summer in Greece doing the digital nomad thing again and I I saw the Arctic co-working lodge on Instagram I've been following them for a little while but I, a post popped up and I just like I felt something and I was like fuck it man I'm booking this I'm going to that place when um and I booked it for the middle of winter I was like I want the uh I want the extremes I want the, the proper Arctic experience um let's go let's do it <laughs> nice nice so before we get into it let's give an idea to the listeners because I don't think if you haven't traveled there or you have, if you are not familiar with geography you might not probably know which regions the Arctic Circle encompass because when we talk about Arctic or the Antarctica we think of this like very barren icy land where nothing exists, right? But the Arctic Circle in itself is not actually the North Pole, right? It actually covers regions that are extremely beautiful and people can actually visit and there are humans living there, right? So what are the areas that the Arctic Circle actually encompass? Yeah, yeah, for sure. The So it encompasses parts of Alaska, Greenland, uh, parts of Canada, um, Finland, Russia. I, I'm not sure the exact bounds, but I know that it's from about in Norway anyway, it's from about, oh, I don't know, it's, it's a bit more than halfway up Norway. Um, mm -hmm. And it even it crosses over into a bit of Iceland as well. Uh, but yeah, it's a big, it's a big bit of land. And, um, and yeah, it's, it's got diverse climate, like the summers, like the summers there are beautiful, like the sun doesn't set. Um, and there's like 24 hour sun. And then the winter is the complete opposite, complete darkness. But in, yeah, it's, it's not like there's, there's thriving community cities in the Arctic Circle. It's, uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot going on. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty magical. I can't remember the, the term of that phenomenon whereby it's 24 hours sun. I think it was called white night or something, is it? That is like- there's a, few, always... uh, there's a few names for it. Yeah, I, I, I think, yeah, I think it's like the polar, the, I don't, well, there's the polar night. I think, yep. uh, I, don't, I don't know if that's it. Yeah, we call it the midnight sun when I was yeah, it's, there, it's, yeah. It's pretty amazing, I can imagine, because I was in, I was in Russia and not not even like that up north the other time for the World Cup. And back then, like even at 2, 3 a.m., it was still like bright as crazy. And it was the first yeah. time I experienced that. I was like, this is insane. Like it's 3, 4 a.m., but then you're walking around and it, it looks like mid-afternoon. So that that's pretty yeah. like, like stunning to when you feel it, actually. You actually come from the Gold Coast, right? So that is where like, everything is super sunny and that's like the dream destination whereby a lot of nomads like to chase after the summer, right? And, and you instead went the other direction where you went to the colder parts of the, the earth, right? Uh, is there a particular reason for that? Like, do you prefer winter or it's just purely to experience the difference since like, you know, the, the hometown is so sunny and we always like, the, the grass is always greener on the other side. Let's <laughs> just put it that way, right? So yeah, yeah I feel like... Um... You know, there's the purpose of travel or the purpose of um, travel for me is like this experience with the other or to experience something that is outside of myself, uh, to experience something new. Um, and in turn, you know, from doing that, I think you get a deeper understanding of yourself. So 
for me, travel has always been about like, what can I, you know, what's a new thing that I can experience? What is the furthest I can get away from my current location geographically, but also my current understanding and ideas of how I see the world. Um, so when I, you know, look for a travel destination, for sure, sometimes I just want to be in a nice, comfortable spot. Like I'm in Sicily right now, enjoying beautiful 35 degree days by the ocean. Like, but, but sometimes, you know, I want to, you know, I want to experience the other, I want to experience something new. So that was a big driving force. Um, towards going, you know, going to the Arctic Circle was, um, yeah, to experience new parts of myself, new parts of the world and, and to have an experience with the other. And, you know, the Arctic, I think for me, you know, represented, uh, you know, the furthest I could go from the known, the furthest I could go from my comfort zone, from, from everything that I, that I knew at that point in time, it, it represented the edge of the world for me, you know, whereas, you know, somebody from Sweden, uh, somebody from, you know, Stockholm or Copenhagen, or, you know, it's still an adventure, but it's like, uh, it's, it's not so far, but for the Gold Coast Australia, it's like to get to, to Lechnes Airport, um, you know, it's, it's probably like three or four days of travel. <laughs> yeah, it's almost the other, the direct other half of the world, right? Because there's Europe and uh, the ocean is almost halfway around the world. So the, the the very interesting part that I just heard you talk about, and I also hear you say it in one of the videos, is this concept of the age, right? And when I hear you say it, it feels to me like that meant a lot of things to you. And you're not just talking about the geographical or the environmental aspect of it in terms of like the Arctic Circle being at the extreme of weather conditions and stuff. I'm sure that plays a part. But when I hear you talk about it, it seems to, to me that you draw it to almost your personal experiences and challenging your own limits to certain things. And that mean, that concept kind of meant a lot more to you than what I hear you say just, you know, physically, right? Tell us more about this because I hear you touch a bit about it. And it seems that it's not just the concept of being in the Arctic Circle, but even the whole life of travel and being nomadic and going to different places kind of plays into this concept of something that you are maybe even searching for right now in your life. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think travel for me has been a catalyst for inner transformation. And um, my pursuit of travel has really been a pursuit of, of personal development, personal transformation, and I think a, per, uh, a pursuit of truth. Um, you know, I think when we, we don't, you know, when we don't move far from where we're born, um, you know, we ended up, we end up living lives that are defined by the ideas of others, by, you know, local ideas. Uh, but the further that I started to travel, um, you know, the broader my horizons got bigger, the, you know, the more I saw of the world, the more possibilities I could imagine for what I could do with my life of who I could be. Um, yeah, so I think, um, you know, for me, travel, for sure, I love going and exploring new places and like geographically, but I think for me, travel's always been about some sort of like inner journey um, and exploring new parts of myself, um, you know, through, through a physical journey. Yeah, and do you journal? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, a lot. <laughs> I, I, I can definitely see that because I, especially from, I saw one of the shots where it was panning across you writing something on a book and then the background or the foreground or the whatever is outside was the mountains of like the Arctic Circle. I assume that's Norway or Iceland when I looked at it and I was like, that definitely feels, definitely has that vibe, right? And whenever you're talking, you're always looking at this this book that you carry with you, then you start talking about stuff that seems to be filled with like a lot of your reflections onto it. How how do you how does that play into your journey? Because I don't particularly journal. Uh, I don't write myself, but there is always times of reflections, particularly when you are by yourself. And especially I can imagine when you are at a very peaceful and tranquil nature, that is where thoughts really flow in, right? How does that play into your journey of traveling? And do you find it being drastically different in the Arctic Circle where, it's, where there's less distractions, I would say, where you're more immersed in nature? Yeah, yeah, there's a few questions. I think, um, yeah, for sure, like how... Like journal, like there's a typical quote, you know, like the unexamined life is not worth living. So I think that's a big part of, of my writing practice and where it started. But I think it's it's grown um, and, and it plays several different roles in my life. I, I was given a, a leather journal, like a beautiful leather journal handcrafted on this farm in North Carolina when I was for my 16th birthday. It's a beautiful leather journal. And it was one of the best gifts I ever got. And that's when I really started um, like a daily writing practice. And, um, you know, it's grown from now. I read a great book called The Artist's Way. And uh, one of the practices in that book is to write three pages every morning. Um, 
yeah, which is which has been a great um, practice for me. Um, just of decluttering the mind. It's been a great tool to keep track of the journey, you know, when I'm moving from place to place. And one of my favorite things to do is to is to reflect and look back and read journals from from years ago and and see, you know, what I was thinking and feeling in that moment, and and to, and to see the growth and um, and then now, you know, as I'm you know, produce, starting to direct and produce, um, you know, some documentaries. Uh, my daily writing is a great, is a great tool for content. Um, and, you know, a lot of my writing from Digital North came from my travel journals, um, you know, over the years before that. Awesome. And, and before we dive specifically into the, the Arctic Circle experience, just throughout your four, five, four, four years plus of travel, right? What do you think has been the most impactful or perspective changing thing that you have encountered that you now looking back at like your 18 year old self that you felt like it was a big difference? Yeah, probably like the biggest, um, the biggest shift that I found was um, probably, cause I grew up in a, you know, where everyone grows up in an environment where they, they're given a certain uh, set of beliefs and ideas around like morality of what is a good life, how to live a good life, what is a moral life? You know, when I had a set morality around what I thought was a good life, but I think the more I traveled, the more I saw that um, there was many ways to live a good life <laughs> and there was many ways um, to do good um, and to live a fulfilling and inspired life. And I didn't have to live my life a certain way, but I could take a little bit from all the people I met and uh, come to my own conclusions about what a good life, um, you know, meant for me. Yep. Yeah. But I definitely think like when you, when you start traveling, the it challenges a lot of like, the societal perspective that you had back home and it's just almost very different and sometimes very contrasting even like it even goes yeah. against what you believe in but when you start seeing a, a lot of like a repetition of beliefs coming in that are different from yours you start to realize there is like so much more to life than whatever it is that the society pushes it to be or your society actually pushes it to be right because Ultimately, yeah. when you go to different countries, different regions, even within the same countries, but different regions, there are huge difference between, say, the city's perspective versus the countryside's perspective and things like that, right? Yeah, yeah, 100%. Like Montaigne talked about it, um, you know, during his travels and his writings, he said, you know, all morality is hypocrisy. And, you know, he traveled far and wide in Europe, and, you know, a lot of travel for his day anyway. Um, and he said that, you know, with all the cultures that he encountered, all the countries he went to, he, he never found a universal morality, but morality, uh, you know, which is essentially the question of what is a good life, you know, um, was always, you know, localized to, to certain geographical places. Um, yeah, so for sure, going and experiencing the world really, um, you know, brought that to my awareness. Yep, yep. Let's talk a bit now about how the life is in the Arctic Circle, right? Why don't you start with an introduction about what exactly is the film kind of about? Like a teaser yeah, that kind yeah. of thing? Yeah, for sure. Cool. Yeah, I guess, um, you know, the Arctic Circle is a unique place and it's not a typical place um, for digital nomads. You know, typically, you know, digital nomads will be in Bali or Thailand or maybe Mexico uh, a play, or Portugal, you know, somewhere kind of set up with the facilities um, to make it easy, life easy, life comfortable, um, cheap, great weather etc cetera, etc cetera. so the idea behind the film was like why are some digital nomads choosing a different path you know why are some digital nomads going <laughs> to the arctic circle where the, you know the sun doesn't rise for a couple of months of the year um where you know a 10 minute drive can turn into an eight hour ordeal where you get blown off the road and have to wait for the snow machine to, to help you and, <laughs> and clear the way, you know, why are people choosing to come and surf out here? You know, there's like, why are people putting on six millimeter wetsuits when, you know, Bali's waiting with 25 degree water and <laughs> 25 degree Celsius water. And I was just fascinated by that question. It's like, why? And then I asked myself, well, I'm very drawn to be here. Why is, why is that? So I should, I got friends, you know, in the digital nomad community in Bali at, at the moment, like a bunch of them. And they're, they're, they're asking me like, Jay, what the hell are you doing in Norway then? Come to Bali. Uh, friends in Portugal, like, what are you doing there then? Come hang out here. And I, you know, I thought there was a story there um, of why a select group of people decided to, to seek a new path. And, and how long do you spend there ultimately, like continuously for the filming or any other time that you were there? Yeah. Yeah. I, I ended up like, I, I originally just booked um, like 40 days, um, but it ended up turning into about four and a half months. Um, yeah. That is a big difference. 
Yeah, yeah. I, I, uh, yeah, I think I just, yeah, I fell in love with the place and I realized, you know, with places like that where there's a bit of a high barrier to entry as far as like gear goes, uh, I ended up buying a car and, you know, I just, I really, it was going to take more of me to really get the, the juice out of there um, because it was, yeah, a place like that requires more of you. And, and you know, part of that was where it required a bit more time, I feel like, to really to get everything I wanted out of that place. For sure, for sure. I mean, like four plus months is definitely better than 40 plus days to like dive deep into a place, right? And which place, which areas do, do you spend the most time in? Yeah, so, so the time was mostly in, um, in Tongstad, in the Lofoten Islands of Norway and then uh, I spent also a bit of time in the West Fjords of Iceland um, so it was, it was balanced between those two places um, but and I also you know I, I also spent some time in the Faroe Islands as well before going there um, and they're also a part of like the Arctic Digital Nomads uh, network so there's also a co-working uh, space there as well. So, so now that you have been there, what exactly, give us an idea, how exactly is, is it like the, the digital nomad landscape in the Arctic Circle? Like, do you have a, uh, do you go in with an assumption on how it looks like? And did it meet your expectations? Or did it like, was it like totally different? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, my, um, it was my first real experience of co-living. So in my travels, um, I've always just kind of got my own accommodation. You know, I'd, I'd spent like when I first started traveling, I stayed in hostels, etc. But, but since like running my business properly, um, I've always just got my own accommodation. So it was my first time staying in like a co-working, co-living environment. Um, so that was awesome. Like the ability, you know, to instantly meet new people with shared values, other online business owners or remote workers um, who, you know, we just instantly connected on like a wide range of things. So, you know, even though we we're in a super isolated place in the world, there was like instant community and connection. Uh, which is pretty, which is pretty beautiful. Um, but yeah, it was, it was amazing. Like my day, like my first, I, I arrived there on the 1st of February, um, right in the, the middle of winter there. The, the winter's a little bit later in, um, in Norway. So the winter, you know, they're kind of like in the, the top of Norway, there's so the winter kind of go, like the snow really starts in, in February um, and March. So I, yeah, I arrived there and we were getting about like maybe three hours of light a day when I first arrived in February. Um, and then the days got longer um, by an hour either side each week that I was there. So by the time I left, the sun wasn't setting. So I really just watched this radical change in, in um, daylight hours. And yeah, when I was first there, you know, like every morning we had to like, like fight to open the door, get the shovel and, you know, there'd be, you know, a lot, a lot of snow and we were staying on the water. So we'd do like morning swims, um, which was a great experience, like getting in the, getting in the icy water every morning. Um, and yeah, surfing in the snow for the first time as well. So I obviously I grew up surfing on the Gold Coast, but in board shorts. So putting on a six millimeter <laughs> wetsuit and, you know, a negative 15 temperature, like, wow. uh, like air temperature and like, you know, two degree water temperature. That was a, a new experience. And do you, do you prefer the summer surfing or the winter surfing? I think I prefer the summer surfing. <laughs> <laughs> but it, you know, it's, a great, it's a great experience. And there's definitely something about the cold water that is just like there's so much life in the cold water. And I, I definitely like have a great affection for the cold water. But I think I definitely choose surfing uh, on the Gold Coast. <laughs> I, I guess it definitely shocks you up, right? Like I did a, I did a plunge. So I, I visited Antarctica before and we did like a polar plunge where you jump into the freaking... I see one and you're like, shit, this is like crazy. Like, like it was an experience, but I probably wouldn't do it again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so so how many nomads were there when you went there? Like the community, how big was it exactly? Yeah, so when I first arrived in like the middle of winter, there was me and two other two other people staying there. So it's not a lot. But then, you know, over the four and a half months, there was I probably met maybe 40 or 50 different nomads that kind of came in and out during my time. People would kind of stay between like three, three weeks to two months. And um, I think at the, the busiest, you know, there might've been like 10 people staying there. And at some points there was like two of us. So um, yeah. Right. And, and do you think three weeks to like two months, that's quite a big range, but do you reckon that is a good range to spend uh, in the Arctic circle or like more specifically in a certain region of the Arctic circle, right? Or do you yeah, think sure. longer like, time is needed? Yeah, it depends. Everyone travels differently. And I think you find what works for you and, and you know, what suits your, you know, your work, your business, your, you know, your, whatever you value. I feel like, um, I feel like, you know, like six weeks to, to for six to eight weeks is probably like a really great time, time up there. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. And, and this might be a, 
might be a funny question to ask because many people will imagine that because it's online business, it can be done anywhere and anyone can be doing anything, right? But do you see certain, do you see that the nomads that shows up at like the Arctic Circle, are they leaning towards a certain business type? The, the reason I ask this is because like, I think certain areas in on earth or cities draw certain type of people. For example, like if you look at Berlin, right? Berlin is extremely controversial in the sense that some nomads love it a lot. Some just don't like it, right? And one of the reasons for, for loving Berlin for a lot of nomads is because the arts and culture scene is huge there, right? So I tend to see a lot of nomads there dealing more with like music production or media kind of stuff, right? So I'm just wondering in the Arctic Circle, do you see a, a trend kind of like that where it's skewed towards a certain type of people that maybe, I don't know, maybe more spiritual related businesses or stuff like that? It was, yeah, there was definitely some similarities, but then again, it was like a really broad range of people, different demographics, ages, businesses. I think a lot of like every, obviously everyone, you know, who was there had a big interest in uh, like adventure or outdoor sports. So we, obviously everyone was kind of, it seemed like everyone who was there was either interested in, in surfing, in backcountry skiing or snowboarding um, or climbing or hiking. You know, some, everybody had like an interest um, for like an outdoor sort of sport. Um, but then, you know, Lofferton is like really unique as in like, there's quite a, um, like there's a cool town, uh, about an hour away from the lodge or 40 minutes away from the lodge, um, called Henningsvar, which, which has quite a cool scene of like artists and musicians and, and creatives as well. Um, a lot of people moving between Oslo and Lofferton. Um, mm. so I had a big mix of people, but I would say, you know, people wanted to be, uh, you know, interested in, you know, outdoor kind of adventure sports. Yeah. Right. Right. And give us an idea of the cost because we have been talking about it saying that that is kind of an expensive place right but uh in most destinations we know that for nomads if we stay longer we can take advantage of more local prices let's just call it that way right so yes. so how does the cost compare uh in your experience yeah so i think um it was my i had a private room in at, at the arctic co-working lodge and i think it was like a thousand euros a month um for, for like a private room uh, and I think the shared rooms might have been like 700 a month. Mm -hmm. And um, and that included like an office um, and like an office desk and everything like that. So, and then there, like you kind of need a vehicle in like a, around there. So you could have to kind of rent a car. Um, I ended up buying one because I was there for long enough. It was cheaper just to buy a car. <laughs> and you <laughs> so saw it before leaving? Uh, no, I actually, so I actually drove it with me. I'm doing, so I'm actually doing a trip okay. at the moment from the top of Norway and driving the car from the top of Norway to Morocco. Mm. Um, so I had the inspiration for the journey while I was there. So the car, my car is actually, I took it with me. It's actually sitting in Holland at the moment while I'm in Italy. Um, <laughs> so, but I ended up buying a car for like a thousand euros because it was like, and it was going to be like 500 euros a month to rent a car. So I just right. bought one. Um, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, that, that, the, just hearing the accommodation actually sounds, it doesn't sound expensive to be honest, like comparatively to other Western Europe countries, a thousand euro a month for a private room with a co-working space usage, right? And plus it's obviously the good. community. Yeah, it's, really, yeah. it's actually pretty good. And how about like day-to-day -day food and drinks kind of expense? Yeah, like, uh, I don't even know. I'm not great. I just kind of spend. I don't really have, I don't really budget too well <laughs> track of my expenses. Um, I think, I know petrol was really expensive. Um, it was some of the most expensive petrol I've ever put in a car before. Like it was, um, I think, you know, it was a small car and it was like, I think, I don't know. It was like close to three euros a liter or something. It was insane. Ooh, okay. Um, yeah. And then day-to-day -day food expenses. Oh, I don't know. Yeah. I, I think I'm lucky with my business being in a position where I didn't, didn't have to worry <laughs> too much about, about, about the expenses. I didn't pay a lot of attention, but I, 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 I did hear like, like obviously alcohol, everything's more expensive in Norway. It's like, I think it's one of the more, more expensive, you know, countries in the, yeah, for sure. in the world. So yeah, alcohol, cigarettes, meat, everything's kind of like, you know, expensive, like more expensive than, than yeah, than just about anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've, I've spoken to travelers that have been to Iceland and they always say like, they almost just have like ham and cheese sandwiches like throughout the whole day. They just get a whole pack of ham pack of cheese and then like those long long packs of bread and then that's their meal for like throughout the whole trip i was like oh that's that's rough as in like you know that's not yeah. too fun right so yeah. so in terms of filming we spoke a bit about the extreme conditions right especially during winter how was filming like like was it difficult because i know you guys also took like outdoor shots and stuff like that 
Yeah, yeah. Um, we made it work. Like Dom, Dom didn't like our cinematographer, and you know he's co-directed it with me, and you know it's been you know we've really it's, it's our creation together. Um, he he didn't. So I, he was in Australia, so I flew him over for the documentary. Um, so I was there, and I, I was there for like he didn't arrive until April. So I think, you know, I wore the brunt and the worst of the weather kind of before he, he kind of got there. So by the time he was there, it, like it wasn't, um, it wasn't too bad. There was definitely some tough days. Like when we were in Iceland, for example, we were going surfing and we, we heard about this surf spot um, from the fishermen. They kind of took us out on their boat and told us about the surf shop, uh, spot. And we got in the car and drove there and we got stuck on the top of this mountain pass. Um, and, and there was no reception, you know, we had to walk three hours to, um, you know, in like negative five degree temperature to, to, to go get help. And we were not dressed for it, you know? So there was definitely challenging situations like that. Like um, on Sundays, it was just so cold and miserable. You just did not want to be outside shooting. So we try and make the best of the, the days when like it wasn't too cold. Um, yeah. Yeah. But there was a, uh, yeah. Dom would be a better ask about that. But yeah, there's definitely some miserable days where it's like, I don't want to be out here. Like even, you know, having to get, you know, when we're out there getting, getting surfing footage and needing more footage of surfing, um, you know, it was miserable just like putting on a wet wetsuit and just <laughs> paddling out there. And it was just like, you know, just didn't want to be out there. But um, and, yeah. <laughs> and so did the filming, the, did it delay in terms of the whole filming process based on, I guess you guys had a schedule that you wanted to follow and, I'm assuming that that got delayed. What was that? Sorry? Like, uh, did the production schedule get delayed because of the filming? Because I'm pretty sure you guys had a had a kind of a timeline in mind in terms of, okay, we're going to film for this number of weeks and then, you know, post-produce for this number of weeks. Did that go according to plan or, or was it like, drastically off the plan? Yeah, no, it's definitely, it's definitely gone drastically longer than we thought. When we originally came up with the concept, we were just going to do Norway. Uh, and then once we we started doing uh, like started putting the plans together, and got Dom over there. Like a few days before we arrived, we got like Dom arrived to meet me. We got an opportunity to then expand it um, to uh, to Iceland as well. So that doubled the the time of filming instantly. Uh, <laughs> and then yeah, we've gone on. We've had some amazing opportunities to get some unique interviews and uh, from, from some expert voices to be a part of that as well. So that's kind of drawn out the filming as well. So we got to interview Chris Burkhard, which was like our, like our number one kind of dream interview for the documentary. He, mm -hmm. he one of his films under an Arctic sky has been, it was a big inspiration for me wanting to, to surf in the Arctic circle. Uh, and then we've also, you know, throughout the film we're, we're, we're covering some themes, you know, like the revolution of remote work uh, and then also the revolution of education and how that's playing a role in people being able to travel the world and, and pursue what's meaningful for them. So we're also interviewing, we just interviewed a, um, a physicist from Australia who's also a uh, new like an online educator and has some really interesting ideas about the future of education we've also done an interview with uh, the man who well, I'm actually interviewing him this Friday um, remotely and uh, yeah we're doing an interview on he's got the record for the longest um, oh, sorry the longest and the first fully unsupported uh, crossing of Antarctica um, Ooh, like what like so, on, on, on foot I think it's a mix of foot and he also has like a kite that he's used. A kite? Um, oh, shit. Okay. Okay. Well, yeah, that like sounds a, interesting. Like, like windsurfing on ice sort of thing. I think that's how he did it. Um, but yeah, so we're getting some amazing interviews as well. So um, we're going to have... And that's going to be voice. in the film. Yeah, yeah. So we're going to have my voice, but then also experts on the Arctic, on education, on remote work. Um, yeah, so it's going to be a cool mix of, of voices and ideas. Sounds exciting. So, so... Speaking of which, I heard uh, during the video that you sent me, I saw Chris. Chris actually mentioned this phrase, Icelandic phrase called "fetaratas," right? That means yeah. you know you just everything is gonna be okay. You just do it, and then should like when things happen. Yeah, I think the Australian translation of that is yeah, should be right, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a very interesting concept because to be to be honest, when I travel around the world, most of the time when I see a society that has this particular concept, right usually belongs to developing countries because like places like India and stuff is where crazy stuff always happens and you know people have a more tendency to go towards that thinking whereby let's relax like this this shit will pass <laughs> right so yeah. so when we look at the Arctic Circle most of the countries within the Arctic Circle obviously we'll consider them more developed nations right but now we are seeing I my assumption is that we are seeing that concept come up because of environmental weather conditions yeah is that right and with your time there do you think you are kind of 
more influenced by this concept, especially based off your experience. I can hear that there are a lot of things that's like that's like going to blow someone's mind when when it happens to them. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think um, you just have to be you have to be flexible in an environment like that. You have to be flexible and resilient, and um, you got to be yeah, you got to be open to having your plans change um, for from circumstances that are just outside of your control. Um, and that's just a part of life there. And I think it's really beautiful, you know, and when, when, when things happen, um, you know, it's, everyone relies on each other. Um, so community is always there and willing to help you, whether you, you're stuck in the car or, you know, there's, you know, yeah, you always need help. <laughs> it felt like anyway, when I was there, I was always need, needing help and there was always people there ready to help. Um, and, uh, yeah. And you just learn to, to be okay with what happens because, Hey, you can't, you can't control what you can't control. Yeah, I, I, I can imagine that the community there might be really tight knit and different because I, I assume it was, it's a smaller community that is more, well, I'll say it's almost like when, when I'll say because I haven't been to the Arctic, but I've gone down south to Patagonia and the areas near there. One of the biggest difference I feel in towns that are along the way of Patagonia as you track up is that there's a different warmth to the people there. Like, like they are just more helpful and they see everyone as like even tourists and travelers as like, part of the community or guests visiting and they're always happy to help with like a lot of different things yeah yeah there's definitely yeah i definitely got to experience that like um yeah there's something about traveling to, to small communities where yeah people are just you know people are just nicer like i've even experienced that just like in being in sicily and in, in the middle of summer like the big cities and the big tourist towns here like it's not that nice of a place to be <laughs> you, there's just a million tourists there and like the the people that are living there are just used to the town being overrun by tourists um but i've moved out to like a little smaller town here called stazo um you know an hour um away from catania or something and uh i'm like the only uh tourist in the town and i walk around the street and everyone's looking at me like who's this guy <laughs> but and everyone's so like friendly and welcome and i think that's like why it's so important when you're traveling to to get off the beaten path and get away from you know, especially if you're traveling longer term, like, you know, if you're traveling for years at a time, the last thing you want to do is just feel like you're in tourist hotspot after tourist hotspot, because that tourist cycle is like just so, so short term. And if you're a long term traveler, you know, in a, in a touristic two week vacation holiday sort of area, it just drains your energy and it's not so nice after a while. <laughs> right, right. So, so is it, is it true that, well, based off the vibe I'm just getting from the whole, whole film, is it very tranquil and peaceful there? Like, is that the general vibe throughout the day? Or like, are there various different stuff happening? Um, do you mean like, like, like for sure, it's like definitely tranquil and quiet and peaceful, like especially in Tungstad, the small little town that we stayed in. And then also in, in the Westfield, it's like a very peaceful. Um, yeah, so beautiful and uh, a lot, yeah, a lot of time for reflection. But then there's also definitely like chaos with the weather, and <laughs> there's definitely moments of like extreme volatility as well. So I think it's got like that perfect balance of, of calm and chaos. Mm -hmm. And do you get? Do you think there are times where you just get bored because there's like nothing to do? <laughs> Um, not, I didn't, I, like, it depends what your personality is like. I'm, I'm a guy who likes his solitude and, and quiet and, and alone time. Um, so I, uh, I can't get enough of that, but I think, uh, I think definitely, you know, after a few months, after like four and a half months, four and a half months of being there, um, getting back into the city life, you know, I went, I went, uh, to Copenhagen and, and Holland afterwards, and it did definitely feel good to be back in the energy of a city for a bit and, uh, to be re-inspired by more people, new ideas and, being out like, you know, just the small things like having like a local coffee shop, you know, underneath your apartment and having like a grocery grocery store close by and just having everything in a city. So we see cities are very convenient. So it's nice like to have those. Ease of the amenities and stuff like that is just way easier. Yeah, because yeah. I, the, the vibe I got from it was really that it's definitely a, spot, a, a place, a destination for outdoors because that's just, in my opinion, the most beautiful attraction or the draw of going there. But it also looks like a very nice, nice place for someone who say, for example, I have a friend who always like to go into like the deep nature when when she wants to write a book and to mm -hmm. think through and reflect through. That looks like the perfect spot to just, you know, yeah. sit and think and spend like a week or two weeks just thinking through your own thoughts and then being able to come out with like a, a concept, right? 
For sure, man. Yeah, definitely. When I was there at the start of, you know, in the, in the depths of winter when we weren't getting a lot of light there for my first month or so and the, the place was quite quiet, it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was perfect for that. You know, I could, I was just, I spent my days writing and reading um, and doing bits of work and yeah, it was a really peaceful time and uh, yeah, I, uh, I want to do that again. <laughs> nice. And is this your first film or have you produced other films before? No, so this is um, this is my first yeah, proper film. Like I've, I've been in marketing, and we you know we, we produce content um, for clients. So we've done a lot of video production and, and directing, like advertising and, and marketing content. But uh, first um, documentary, yeah. And and I mean, we have heard a bit about the the personal reason on why you want to do this, right? When you when you visited the Arctic Circle, and it sounded really interesting. But is it is that the only reason, or are there anything when you look at it from a more career or business perspective where does this you know this film or like doing video or documentary production fall into place yeah for sure like I, i'm a big believer that like one film or one book can you know really change someone's life forever because i you know and i know it's happened to me i've watched a watched a documentary or, or read a book and it's just completely altered what i thought was possible for my life and and breathe new life and new possibilities uh into me so i think that's been a big driving force uh, behind uh, this new pursuit of you know creating some documentary films um and you know my my hope with this film is that you know one person watches this and you know gets inspired to to go and seek you know a new path a new journey whatever that might look like for them um but, you know, I think uh, inspiration is just infectious and uh, mm -hmm. being able to like create something that I, you know, hope will, will you know, infect some people with uh, inspiration. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty confident that we are just looking from the trailer. I think, I think it sounds pretty interesting. And, and like I say, I definitely see the storytelling aspect of it being pretty impactful, especially when you talk about the guests that are coming on. I think some of them are definitely going to have like a lot of pretty interesting things to share, right? Um, and looking at this film, right? Who, who do you think is your ideal target audience when you look at it or when you guys start planning it? Yeah, I hope that it can like, my, and my hope is that it can reach like a really broad audience and, and meet people where they're at, you know. I think uh, in particular, you know, I'd love to inspire young people, you know, perhaps finishing high school and looking at their life and looking at future possibilities um, and seeing that there's more options than university or college or whatever their teachers and parents have planned for them and, and to give them, uh, you know, uh, some new ideas about what they could do that perhaps they could, you know, they could travel the world and, and work online. Um, Cause I think, you know, for, for me, travel is, is being my education. I didn't go to, I didn't even, I didn't finish high school. I didn't go to university. I, um, you know, I, I, you know, took my education with me online by, you know, investing in coaches and mentors and courses. And um, so my hope is that other people who maybe didn't fit into the school system or, uh, you know, don't want to follow like a traditional pathway, they'll see this as a potential path for them. Interesting. And, and as your first production, right, what do you really, really like about it? Like in terms of the whole process of producing something like that, although like, I'm sure you still have a bit of work to do to finish the, the masterpiece, but so far throughout the process, what is it that you enjoyed the most? Yeah, for sure. Like, there's been there's been some cool parts. Like, I've really I like I really enjoyed connecting and interviewing Chris. Like, that was a that was a childhood dream of mine to be able to interview Chris. Like, he um, he's played a big part in you know, like I said, my my inspiration for going to the Arctic Circle. Um, you know, I really I really enjoyed writing the storyline. Um, you know for for the for the documentary and it's been a real process of learning like what does it take to create a documentary like when we first you know because when i first was inspired to like you know create a documentary i had some ideas but i was like to dom you know the cinematographer and co-director with me he, um and i'm like man just come over to norway we'll just create a documentary and he's like well yeah what are we going to create it about <laughs> i was like oh we'll, we'll, figure, we'll figure it out just get it here um, so the, the, you know, the process of learning, you know, what it takes to bring a film to life, um, has been like a really rewarding journey as well. And, uh, yeah, we've learned, learned so much. Sounds like Dom had a lot of faith in you <laughs> to just show up all the way <laughs> around the world like that. But, but yeah. I'm sure for a cinema talk about that, so I think that's a very dream environment to be able to like shoot stuff in and produce things in because of the dramatic landscapes and everything. I'm imagining that that's actually, is challenging for sure, but I think that's like, um, like the final product can look pretty amazing, right? Um, and what's the what's the thing that you hated about the whole process? Is there anything that you're just like shit? This this sucks. Yeah, like there's definitely um, 
like the Arctic Circle, like just being in the Arctic Circle in general, it gets, uh, you know, there's a lot of inconveniences and, and things that you just take for granted and easy parts about your life. Just, you know, everything can become a bit of a mission. <laughs> like, like, for example, like a big part of my life is I love to go to the gym, you know, like I love to look after my health and, you know, I would like to go to the gym or yoga um, or even go for a run, you know, on a regular basis. But when I first got there, it was like the closest gym was a 30 minute drive away. Most days you couldn't drive because of the weather. Um, I couldn't run because the roads were icy as, so you just slip. <laughs> oh, thanks. Um, and, you know, so a lot of the things you just take for granted. There's a lot of inconveniences and there's a lot of things you have to push through to get the rewards. Um, so that was, you know, you know, a pleasure and pain. Um, and then obviously like, you know, learning to create a documentary, it's a new experience and there's like, there's many challenges. Um, you know, across many different areas. Um, so yeah, just no matter what you do, you got to embrace, you know, embrace the challenges. And, and, you know, this documentary, I think was really a process of me and Dom, you know, pursuing challenges that inspired us. Because we, I, I think we figure, you know, you've got to pursue, you got to have challenges in your life, no matter what you do. So find worthy challenges. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe we can talk a bit about this. And I'm not sure if it's a relevant topic, but where do you where do you get the funding for such a thing, right? Like if someone is inspired to do something after watching your, your film and they are thinking like, hey, this actually sounds really interesting and I want to do something for my hometown or like a certain place that I... Because I, I realized that there's a lot of up-and-coming destinations that are still pretty untouched but has a lot of potential. So if someone is interested to tell another story of another place, right? Where do they, practically speaking, where do they go about like seeking funding or like, you know, planning something out to do? Yeah, for sure. Like I'm a big believer that um, to live an empowered life, you know, of doing what's deeply meaningful to you, um, wealth creation is like the number one key. <laughs> so if you want to live a life on your terms, doing what you want, building a cash flow business is like number one. Otherwise, you know, everyone could have great dreams about things they want to do, projects they want to bring to life. But if you don't have a cash flow business, um, you know, they're probably going to stay dreams unless unless you go out there and, and um, you know, get funding, which yeah which is you know so we were lucky and like so i you know just self-funded at the start and uh once some people heard about what we were doing we we're able to get some support from the arctic digital nomads group to help subsidize the cost um but yeah i've, I've funded it out of my own pocket with, with a little bit of support from the arctic digital nomads mm, nice nice and what let's dive deeper into because i know you're also the founder of uh, lion social right and what do you guys do at Lion Social in terms of like digital marketing? Do you cover a whole spectrum or is there a specific focus? No, yeah, we're pretty specific. Like obviously when I started, it was quite broad, but we've honed into quite a, um, a narrow um, service where we help online coaches and educators um, build like acquisition systems. So yeah, we, we build um, essentially like book funnels. Um, so we help coaches sell many copies of their books um, and then turn people who buy their book into um, clients for them. Oh, that's interesting. A specific focus on book funnels. As in yeah, funnels yeah. are definitely the trend, but book funnels are pretty specific. Yeah. That's, that's interesting. Okay. Um, okay, and let's talk about for nomads that want to go to the Arctic Circle, right? To spend some time, right? What are the tips that you have for someone that's looking to go there? Because apparently there's like quite a lot of things to also think about, right? Uh maybe like what's the best season to go, or when is the cheapest, or what are some things that you know, it's not available there or hard to, or expensive to find there that they should bring along and tips like that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think first is like pick the season that, you, that you'd like to go there in because there, it's a very different place depending on the season. So, you know, I, I went, yeah, in kind of like the winter season and, you know, and I, got to, I got a bit of a taste at the start of, um, the start of summer. I, I left before the official start of summer, but I got those, you know, those longer days um, and like the, the, the almost midnight sun. Um, so I would start by picking, you know, what you want to be there. Some people want to be there in the, the summertime when everything's green and you can hike and camp outside. Um, yeah, so I'd say start, you know, start by picking what time of the year you want to be there because it's a different place uh, depending on the time of year. Uh, and then, yeah, for, for me, like one of the biggest, like things are expensive in Norway, especially gear and especially in a remote place like that. So I rocked up with no surfing gear, um, no gear whatsoever. I, I rocked up from Copenhagen where I was just wearing jeans and a jacket. So I had to kind of just like fork out and buy everything there. It's got to be the most expensive place in the world to buy a surfboard. Um, <laughs> so I, um, yeah, so if you, if you know what you want to do before you get there, you know, come prepared with some gear, with clothes. Because it's uh yeah you pay you pay a lot more once you're up there. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine, especially most of the gear are like 
bulky stuff as, as well. So I can imagine they are almost at the higher end of item pricing in general as well. Yeah. All right. And, and regarding this film, what's the, and I don't know if you guys have this yet, but what's the general release date or like when does the trailer come out and stuff like that? Yeah. Yeah, we should have like an official trailer out by the, um, probably by like the end of August, we'll have like an official trailer out. Um, and then, yeah, we plan to release um, like November, December. November, December this year. And and where can people catch it? Like what is the plan of which platforms are you guys planning to release on? Yeah, we, we, we've got a few different opportunities um, via the distribution and we haven't like locked in anything yet. So the best way to stay up to date with the project would just be to follow me on Instagram at you know, jtop but a zero <laughs> instead of an O on my last name, J-A-Y-T-0-P-P. -P. Uh, and then like, yeah, all the details uh, around the project, I'll, I'll give regular updates there and uh, yeah. Gotcha. And where, where can other people connect with you apart from Instagram? I'll definitely drop your Instagram link in the show notes, but what are other avenues to connect with you uh, to find out more about what you do and stuff like that? Yeah, probably like my Instagram page is probably the best place. Um, I've also got li like lion.social is my work Instagram and uh, lion.social is also um, like the URL for my, my work website if anyone wants to check mm -hmm. that out. Um, but yeah, Instagram is where I, where I spend most of my time. I, I'm on Twitter a little bit as well. Um, but I, uh, yeah, Instagram is where I have the most fun, I think. Awesome, awesome. I'll get people to go there. And so lastly, what's the what's next for you? Like after this, I'm sure now you're focused on like trying to tie this thing up, right? And in, in the production, and of course, after that, the, the publicity and marketing and stuff of this. But what do you have like another production plan in mind or like, what are you looking at? Yeah, for sure. We um we just actually booked on flights like an hour ago uh, for him to come over and meet me in Holland in the beginning or the, yeah, middle of, yeah, beginning of September, middle of September. And uh, we, we're halfway through the filming at the moment of my journey of driving from the from the Lofoten Islands in Norway to Morocco in a van. Um, so I'm taking a, a break from that journey right now and to spend some time in the Mediterranean. But we'll yeah, we'll go shoot that documentary um, from the middle of September, and it's called The Inner Journey from the uh, from the Arctic oh. Circle to the Sahara Desert. And it's all about how tra travel can be a catalyst for inner transformation, and and how a geographical journey uh, is typically just an alibi for an inner journey that we that we want to go on. That's going to be very interesting. So that is a separate documentary from the Arctic Circle one, right? Yeah, That's yeah. very interesting. I think I'm going to have you come up again when you are done filming that one. <laughs> because the, the, the inner thoughts of like, well, and, and this was the quote that I also saw in the concept whereby the longest journey or the deepest journey is the one within, right? And that's definitely something that I believe in a lot myself. So hearing about that, it seems that that documentary is going to focus a lot around this particular concept, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, we, we get to touch on that in a journey in um, in Digital North and we get to talk about that a little bit as we like talk about those themes for sure. But this next documentary, you know, I really wanted to hone in on that idea and that theme because it's been such a big, big theme in my life and my travels. And I think to create a piece sp specifically on that, that concept um, is super inspiring to me. So I'm, uh, yeah, I'm really, really excited to bring that one to life. Yeah, yeah, that sounds exciting. All right, man. I will definitely catch up with you again on that. And actually before that, I definitely want to know when this particular Digital North uh, film comes out. So thank you, Jay, for coming on today. Like that was a very interesting conversation and I definitely look forward to seeing the film. Yeah, thanks, man. It was, it was a pleasure to meet you. I appreciate you having me on.